So generally, when you look at other sources in the sky, um, uh, other sources of cosmic rays, you have a fairly good idea what the what the uh, what what is responsible for accelerating particles to such energies. For example, you could have a a black hole, or you could have a supernova shock. For example, when a uh, when a star explodes and it expands into the interstellar medium, it uh, it actually accelerates particles in the medium, in the interstellar medium, and you see these sort of uh, shock waves, and you see these um, a supernova remnants, for example, and you see black holes, for example, they also accelerate particles and produce jets and outflows and uh, whatnot. So you always see a source of acceleration there. Um, the trouble with these. Um, uh, sort of strands or filaments that we saw is that they, they're, they're definitely cosmic rays. There are uh, lots of them and there is really no obvious source that is accelerating these particles to such high energies. Uh, that's, that's the mystery of it. This is a telescope of, um, it's actually an array of tel telescopes, there are about 64 of them, and it's brand new and it's uh, incredibly powerful. Um, can you imagine, you have 64 telescopes simultaneously looking at a part of the sky. So that's one aspect. The second aspect was that the source that we are studying is in the nucleus of our galaxy. wanted to have an image of the sky, a, a sort of a rich region of the sky, and they spent over two, 200 hours um, to look at the nucleus of the galaxy. And so as a result, it's a, a very nice image and it has captured really imagination of many, many people, whether you're a scientist or not. And that's, the, uh, that's why, um, and then we, we had, uh, they asked me to be part of uh, the team uh, who, uh, who observed the center of the galaxy and I was able to help out in a different direction and that's how we really started out working with this, with this uh, image, meerkat image of the, of the galactic center. Now all of a sudden you see uh, the, the entire sort of forest and you see the big picture and the sensitivity of the telescope was so good that um, you could actually detect a large number of these filamentary structures. So what's really the point of all that is that you can now for the first time to do population studies of these uh, uh, structures. Up until now, we were not really able to really do that. People studied basically a, a, a filament here and a filament there and a filament there. So now you have the entire system of filamentary structures with a good resolution and sensitivity. And now we actually are um, learning quite a bit about their properties, the mean properties of these filaments and a lot of other characteristics that define the nature of these filaments. And that's a big step because that allows us to actually further our understanding of the origin of the filaments. And it's almost like we, we're sort of one step closer to really understand the nature of these uh, mysterious structures. So that's really two sort of models that people are thinking about. Uh, one is basically a causal, an object is basically responsible for production of these individual filaments. And the other is more about the nature of the medium itself that allows instability to take place. And that causes these corrugations. And then of course, magnetic fields gets basically bright and you see these structures running next to each other.
Yeah, this tell us uh, the, the 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 source at the center of the galaxy is a is is a is a black hole which is uh, four million times than the mass of the sun, and this um, this source is. Uh, um, is the closest black hole, supermassive black hole to us. So it's almost like acts like the sun. You know, sun is the closest star to us. And here is, you have the closest supermassive black hole um, to us. So you really have to study it and you can study it very carefully and uh, because of its proximity to us. And that really gives us a fantastic advantage because if you want to look at another black hole, you have to go further, 100 times further away from um, you know, from the black hole at the center of the galaxy in order to study, and of course, things become fainter, weaker, all that. So it's it's just a little bit more complicated. Here, we have this this fantastic laboratory to study supermassive black holes. So that's one advantage. The other advantage is that this black hole is varying in time. So every day or so, you know, it has flaring taking place about five times. It flares, and and we still don't understand exactly what is the nature of this flare. Uh, we think that it's some kind of an outflow. Uh, it's sort of a small burp, you, call, you may want to call it, uh, because it's not a super massive outflow. It's not like a really violent, incredibly violent, but it just basically uh, sends out this um, flaring event, and each flare is about something like half an hour. And um, so I think people are fascinated to really study this kind of a flaring event taking place every day. Um, and it happens in near infrared. Um, and of course, it continues on. You can also look at it in different, different wavelength bands. So people are interested to know the nature of flaring events that are taking place uh, in a supermassive black hole. Um, you cannot see this kind of events in other in nuclear galaxies, other bl supermassive black holes. They do vary, but the variation time is longer time scale. So I think by understanding what the nature of these flaring events are, what's how the origin of these flares, we can actually provide some clues as to what's going on in uh, the flaring or variability that happens in other nuclear galaxies and quasars, for example. So it's a, it's a sort of a stepping, um, uh, so it's, it's stone for us to really learn more about the nature of other um, flaring events that take place in, in nuclear weather galaxies.